All right, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Mark Zarefsky. I work in the Marketing and Communications Department here at Medill and want to thank you for coming out to Beyond the Box Score, a look at race in sports and sports journalism. Uh, it's part of Medill's uh, Gertrude and G.D. Cron G.D. Crane Jr. Lecture Series. Uh, we have a great collection of sports, sports journalists here representing five generations of Medill alumni. Uh, their bios are included on your handouts, but I want to just briefly give introductions so you know who's going to be talking, and then we're going to get started. <coughs> My immediate left, uh, Kevin Blackestone. is a frequent guest on ESPN's Around the Horn and holds the Shirley Povich Chair of S in Sports Journalism at the University of Maryland. To his left, Sean Jensen, who's the Chicago Bears beat writer for the Chicago Sun-Times and has covered the NFL since 1998. On his left, uh, Ndidi Massey, uh, is a former All-American softball player here at Northwestern uh, and currently is the Director of Business Operations and Development for ESPN Rise, which is the company's high school brand. Uh, next, Bob Eaton uh, is, has spent more than 40 years in television news and retired in 2007 as Senior Vice President and Managing Editor at ESPN. And last but not least, Coley Harvey is a Florida State beat reporter for the Orlando Sentinel and this past fall was one of 65 national voters in the weekly College Football Associated Press College Football Poll. So the way this is gonna work, I have a series of questions that the panelists are gonna talk about, then we're gonna open it up to the audience for a little bit of Q&A as well. Uh, following that, there'll be a little reception outside <coughs> where the panelists will also be available. On the back of the handouts that you guys have, uh, and you guys should have, or you guys saw before, um, there are two graphs that chart the racial disparity uh, in a variety of sports leagues as of 2010. Uh, there's also a chart of the racial disparity in newsrooms affiliated with the Associated Press sports editors. So my first question for the panel, uh, as you know, the vast disparity in races comparing the sports to the newsroom. Uh, what issues or obstacles, if any, do you think uh, develop as a result of this disparity? Uh, between sports journalists and the athletes that they're covering. And it can be open to anybody. Everybody looks at me. Wow. <laughs> well, first of all, I'll say that uh, if you work, walk in any press room in America, you won't see what's gathered here. This is, uh, this is an aberration to have uh, two black men, a uh, black woman, uh, uh, a man of Asian descent, and one white man. Uh, you, you don't see this. Um, and <coughs> I would also add that I'm sure you're referring to, to uh, Richard Lapchick's study that he does every now and then, um, uh, in which he gives out letter grades to, uh, um, in this case, the media in terms of diversity hiring. <coughs> I think he gave an F for gender, and I think he raised his grades to C plus for people of color, although I think in some categories uh, they were down, maybe in terms of editing, and in some other categories they were barely up. Um, and uh, I would just say that's a, <coughs> that's a real problem. It's kind of a roundabout way to maybe answer your question, but um, I would just say it's a real problem because uh, I think most of us here and maybe most of the people in this room who got into journalism got into it because it's a, it's a uh, critical um, endeavor in this country when you talk about democracy and, and uh, how viewpoints are formed about people. and. Um, I've always thought that that, that sports is, uh, has been a particular prism through which different people get to view other people and different people get to view themselves. And uh, right now with the growth of the internet and the decline of print publications, um, what you've had is a loss of, of interest and um, determination to try and um, bring some modicum of equality between people in the newsroom and the communities you're covering. Um, and as a result, right now what you're finding is, is that media, new media is starting to look like really, really old media. It's becoming uh, increasingly all white, becoming increasingly all white males. And as a result, I think a lot of the interpretation of what gets covered um, uh, is going to be um, distorted because of that. Just in in my experience, I just uh, I look at 
the, the importance of diversity among the people who are writing and presenting the news, I think it's, it's so important to people who kind of um, sift through it because you need that diversity of opinion. You know, and the practical experience that I lean on is when I was an intern at the Charlotte Observer, um, during my time there, you know, I worked in, in news and also did some sports copy editing, but the, the rapper Notorious B.I.G. You know, had passed. And I remember I was sitting in on the news meeting and, you know, well, what do we do with this? And I look around and, of course, I have no say because I'm an intern, but um, so I'm basically just a fly on the wall. And predominantly white editors decided, well, it's not that big a deal. Most of them hadn't even heard of who he was. And so the plan was really to relegate the story inside features, you know, and this is one of the most impactful, meaningful African-American rappers of his time in Charlotte, which, you know, there's a large African-American population. And that just showed me at that point just why it's important to have, you know, to knowingly try to at least have a little bit of diversity so somebody could raise their hand and say, hold on a second, you know, my son loves that guy and, you know, this is, uh, we're making a mistake here, we should consider, you know, putting it on the front page in some capacity. And uh, the other practical experience I can think of is I, I've had the pleasure of cover a lot of different athletes, and uh, two of the ones that I've covered is Brett Favre and Randy Moss. And it frustrates me, Kevin and I were both columnists at AOL, but it used to frustrate me to no ends because they're very similar in sort of the things that they've gone through. You know, Brett and Randy both have had some transgressions. And yet, for all that Brett's been through, predominantly white media has given him a pass. Oh, you know, he, he endured that stuff. He's a better man for it. Meanwhile, Randy does things that were, frankly, less, you know, uh, hurtful and significant than what Brett went through, and yet everybody would constantly hold that over Randy Moss. And me knowing both of these men, I can tell you from my experience that Randy is a better person than Brett is. As crazy as that may sound to some of you guys out there, Randy Moss is not a bad person. You know, I mean, he's, you know, moody, he's got some issues, you know, he's, uh, he acts like a diva, but he does a, lot of, he does a lot of good things for a lot of people that people don't know about. And, and I knew about those things, and I, I often wrote about those things. So I always was very frustrated at how Randy Moss was portrayed and could never, ever, you know, shed that sort of tag of being this malcontent, jerk, you know, selfish person. And, and it's funny because, you know, the Vikings would win a game, and if Randy had three catches for 20 yards, he didn't care. Randy just wanted to win the football game. But, you know, on the flip side, if he had 250 yards and they lost the game, he was as upset as anybody else, and he wanted to catch, instead of 10 passes, 11 passes for 275 yards because he felt he could have been the difference in the outcome. You know, so meanwhile, you get Brett Favre, who really in many ways is so narcissistic and cares about you know, how he's viewed and represented, and uh, I, I just felt his was a lot less genuine. So that's something that kind of has frustrated me. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I would kind of um, agree with what um, both Sean and, and Kevin said, and, and that those who are reporting the news and those who are making the decisions of what's actually being reported, uh, it's really important to have a diverse group of people making these decisions. I, I'm more, I live in the content world at ESPN, but on the business side of the content world. So I'm more in meetings about w not how, who's going to go out and be the reporter, but more so what's going to be presented, what's going to be on the cover of a magazine, w on a show, what's going to be our lead story. And it's, it's very biased, and um, a lot of it depends on the final decision maker, which in our world are majority white men. And, and then obviously with me being a woman, I actually, the numbers are worse on the gender side than they are on the race side. And so, and I'm kind of, I get the double dosage of being a black woman um, in terms of voice, in terms of um, contributing to, to what folks want to see and what news is actually being reported. So I, I just think we get better stories if we have a bigger diverse group making those choices as well as reporting. I think the stories are more well-rounded and, and quite frankly, I think those two put together make stories more accurate. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. Um, I think it's, it's terribly important to have a diverse reporting staff. I think the issue is 
um, we need more diversity on the management level. And that is only going to happen when people like three, four of you decide at some point to stop being reporters and go inside and become editors <laughs> and become management and change the system. And you can rail about it, <laughs> and you can say that it's unjust, but until you do that, you were going to leave it in the province of white guys like me. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, and he's done a fine job, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's 100% that's correct. You know, I've, I've talked to a couple of mentors and friends of mine who are in the business, and they always say, Coley, would you want to be an editor one day, or, or would you want to do content and management? And I'm like everybody else, I want to report, you know, I want to get out there, I want to break the story, I want to write the story, you know, I want to, I want to follow in the footsteps of some of these, these colleagues I have here before me. But at the end of the day, I also say, you know, I do feel an amount of social responsibility because here I am, someone who is in a position to make a difference. There aren't too many people who look like me who are my age who are in newsrooms, you know. I mean, not just as we're saying blacks in general, black men in general, we're talking about young people as well. There aren't too many people under 30 who are, uh, who are working in this business. And so I, I have to take that into consideration as well as I move forward in my career and say, well, maybe, maybe someday I might want to listen to Bob. Um, something I wanted to touch on quickly that, that both Sean and Ndidi just pointed out was voice. You know, you, you, you talk about the fact that these athletes sometimes look at reporters and say, I don't look like you. You don't understand me. You don't understand my culture is really what they're getting at. Not necessarily race so much, it's more the culture. And you know, you look at the Michael Vick situation. Dogfighting is, regrettably, sadly, that is a subculture within a larger culture. And a lot of reporters at that time when all that was going on just really didn't understand it. You know, they really didn't have a good take as to why this, for some people, wasn't so important. You know, why it wasn't su such a big deal to, to some people. I'm not saying it wasn't, I'm just saying that that other side wasn't necessarily told. And that's why you've got to have that voice to have people, granted, I've never really paid attention to dog fights like live in front of me. I've never seen it happen, but I understand them, you know, because I, I have a certain connection to that culture because of who I am, who my friends are, where I, you know, some people I know. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of what I want to get at is just the voicing is, um, is as important as also the management and being able to tell some of those more diverse stories that we just don't, don't get a chance to tell. Can, can I just jump in here one quick second? I just wanted to say that there are some of us who actually chose the management side <laughs> and, not, and, and, and chose that for a reason. Um, and I, you know, for a lot of you that are students out here, I would say you should, as you graduate and jobs are harder and harder to find, is you should potentially look at that management side as an opportunity and not necessarily a plan B. It's, it's, there are great careers on the business side of the content world and media companies. So, it, I mean, I, I'm an attorney as well, so once I figured out I didn't want to be a journalist, you know, I went the next step, thought it, MBA, law, and, and knowing that I still wanted to be in the journalism world. So I think that that is an option, and, and again, kind of what you were saying is, the more of us that are in there and hire the editors and hire the writers, I mean, I can, tell you, I can tell you the group of black people in my group, I personally made sure they were hired. I called the hiring editors, and, and a lot of them are Medill alums, <laughs> and I said, you better talk to this person, and you better seriously talk to this person. And once the, our editors, once they were in front of our editors, they were so impressed, it, it, was, it was done. I didn't have to put any pressure on them, but I think the pressure is getting skilled, qualified and experienced candidates in front of decision makers and getting them there, not as a token interview, but as a real interview when a job is truly open. So. Coley, I want to build off the issue of voice with probably the bis biggest example in the past year with LeBron, his decision to take his talents to South Beach. Uh, obviously, he took a hit and a dip in his popularity uh, after the fact. He only just apologized about his decision and the way he handled it yesterday after uh, the win against Boston. Do you guys think it was just the way the decision was handled that impacted his dip in popularity, or like he suggested, was race a factor? 
I'll jump in first. Uh, I mean, they're probably going <laughs> to refute what, I, what I'm about to say. But I, I, truthfully, this is my personal opinion. I don't. I think race did have a factor somewhere, but it's not the end all be all. Truthfully, at the end of the day, I think people looked at that situation and said that was kind of a jerk move. You know, to to be in this city for so long, to have been born and raised down the road. The people in Cleveland just, you know, they just went nuts. People saw the images on TV of his jerseys being burned and that kind of thing, and the rest of the nation followed. Was race a factor? I do believe at the end of the day, yes, because there was some of the reporting early on probably had gaps. You know, it had holes where you weren't getting, okay, why, uh, why is this mega athlete who happens to be black, why is he so vilified? No one could really put their finger on that. And I'm not saying that necessarily if you had a black reporter or columnist who was able to, to, to write that and put their finger on that. I'm not saying that that would necessarily solve the issue, because it might not, but, you know, but, but, that, but that was also lacking as well, you know, I guess I, is, is my point. I'm one of those people, race often has, plays a factor in a lot of things, but I really don't feel like race played a factor in that. It was just a jerk move, period. I mean, you know, it was a very selfish, you know, look at me, look at me sort of thing, you know, takes, uh, strings along his hometown, you know, goes out to some community. It, it was so manipulative, like every single pro, you know, step of the process. And then to have Jim Gray basically on board, to, you know, to deal with the questioning in a certain way, it just, they really tried to manipulate us, meaning everybody, you know, and, and try to take advantage of, uh, of, I don't know, just like as if they were smarter than everybody else. and. People quickly caught on that no, you're you know we, we see through all this right away. People saw through it, and uh, I you know it's great that he's sort of regrets it now. You know I, I can see if he would have just said that from the jump, you know hey I don't think I can win here in Cleveland. I'm going to go to a team that that I think I can. I think people would have respected that a little bit more. But I just think of how where I don't really have a hometown per se because I was born in Korea, but. I just can't imagine what the people in Cleveland felt, these people who really embraced him as he's our local star. And I think of here in Chicago, I mean, a lot of you guys are Derrick Rose fans. I mean, think of when he becomes a free agent and Derrick decides, you know, he's going to hold a press conference and it's not in Chicago. You're, well, what's going on here? You know, and, and how would the people here feel if he decided to leave under similar circumstances? So it was, I think it was just a really, really selfish move on his part, period. Yeah, and I, and I would second all of that. I would just add uh, one sentiment that's come up here, and that's just that black athletes are more easily villainized in the media uh, and in the public than are white athletes. I mean, there have been a, any number of white athletes who have made decisions not to go to a city for whatever reasons um, who become uh, enemies maybe in that city. I can remember Kiki Vandeway in Dallas um, uh, as being one, um, John Elway for a short while in, I believe, uh, Indy. Indy. Indy, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, yeah. clearly, as as you've pointed out, um, uh, villainy has not followed them for the rest of their careers. Uh, and I think um, LeBron James will uh, will eventually escape that, but uh, obviously it's lingered over his head for a long time. Um, I guess, Sean, you were talking about your experience with the Biggie story and also with your experience with Favre and Moss. Have you guys ever, I guess, in your professional experiences, had a time where your race became an obstacle <laughs> in a story that you were covering? And if so, what did you do to overcome it? You know, I, I'll, I, I hate to keep talking. <laughs> being, being an Asian male, in the sports world, it's it's very unique because you know I'm not black and I'm not white, you know. And so, for instance, at the last Olympics, you know I'm covering the U.S. men's basketball team, and I'd be one of the first people there, and I would start to ask a question to one of the American players, and their face would just drop because they're expecting me to like speak Chinese, you know. <laughs> they're shocked that I spoke such good English. Um, but you know, it, it's really interesting because. Um, you know, I think it's just natural. You know, you're, you're a white reporter. Maybe you gravitate initially to break the ice with some white athletes, black with black. And I, d I don't know. I just have never really looked at people that way. I guess I don't have a choice. But the best example I could think of was 
in 1996, I was an intern at the Tennessee and in Nashville. And I was assigned by my black sports editor, Neil Scarborough, who I'm sure everybody here knows mm -hmm. in some capacity because he's worked everywhere. But uh, Neil had sent me out to cover a NASCAR truck race. <laughs> and so I go out to the NASCAR truck race. And I'm excited because I, I wanted to cover everything. So I was really excited. I'd never covered a NASCAR race. So I go out there, get in the press box, and I'm front row, you know, getting unpacked in my bag. And this guy's just literally like right where Kevin is. And I'm like, can I help you? He's like, oh, no, we just uh, we want to make sure you're OK. You know, you, you need any help? And I said, no, I'm good. And then he just wouldn't move, right? And so I'm like, I'm like, seriously, what's going on here? And then he didn't really say anything. And then for the first time, it kind of I looked at the name, and it's Sean Jensen. And I kind of thought, I don't think this guy thinks I'm Sean Jensen. You know, I think he expected me to be like, you know, you know, my Sung Jin Kim, which is my Korean name or something. And so what I did is I pulled out my Tennessean badge and showed him, you know, and, and I didn't embarrass the guy, but I was like, you know, oh yeah, you know, I'm I'm here at my spot and you know, this is my first race or whatever, and then they, the guy kind of backed up. But I kind of had a panic moment. Because here I was in the stadium of like 30,000 people or whatever it was. I don't know what the race track there held, but it was a lot of people. And I was literally the only person, <laughs> I think, of color in the entire place. I don't think there was even a black person there. You know? And uh, I, that, that's the <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> yeah. So that's about the most uncomfortable that I ever felt. And I was just like, wow, this is, uh, this is really interesting. But what I found is, is that because I was different, all the people almost went out of their way to be nice to me, even if it was contrived. It was, you know, they, they kind of didn't want to be the one, you know, to look like a jerk toward the, you know, toward the Asian guy, you know, so. Yeah, I wouldn't say, um, you know, I, I'm sure at some point it's been an impediment, but I've just kind of overlooked it or worked around it. But what has been disturbing um, over the years in, in, in sports, and I've done, I've done business reporting, I've done news reporting, um, and, and mostly sports the last 20 years, um, is when a black writer breaks a story or gets some information from a black athlete that becomes a big story. Um, the assumption uh, with your competitors mm. is that you got that because that athlete is black and you're black, not because of your quality as a reporter. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I can remember one time that came up with a, a competitor of mine, and uh, I was not real happy about it. Um, uh, because it was my reporting, and not that I was black, that got me the information. It was because I asked the right question, and maybe someone else didn't, or maybe they didn't follow up. And so uh, sometimes that, you know, that's a, that's a real frustration. I would say for, for me, um, what, I, what I've experienced and some of the talent that I've hired is, is much more a gender issue than a race issue. I have uh, a young woman that I hired a year ago, an uh, African-American woman, to report on-air um, high school sports across all the ESPN platforms. And she is constantly questioned about her knowledge of football, hmm. hands down. Hmm. And, and quite frankly, I would question a lot of reporters on their knowledge of football who didn't play. There are a lot of male reporters who also report on football who didn't play the sport. That's the obvious thing they say for her is, mm -hmm. you never played. And this particular woman <laughs> was an Olympian, a track and field Olympian. She was sh from Canada, ran track at USC, was you know top of her game in her sport, which is more than a lot of the male reporters, period, in any sport. But she, we were constantly getting the questions, is she, she's not qualified, she's not qualified. And she was absolutely qualified, and she did her homework. And, um, and then from the players, you know, they get that they don't take her seriously. She's on air, so she's quite attractive. They're, they'd rather hit on her than answer her questions. And I think there's just a whole different dynamic with women reporting than men. Gender aside. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, race aside. No, I think that's absolutely true, um, and I think in sports it is it, that, that women are far more likely to be discriminated against, um, and and or have difficulties. I, I tell you a brief story. But at ESPN, we did a, a lot of research on the the programs we broadcast, and and particularly NFL Sunday Countdown, which is the big Sunday pregame show. 
And at one point we were doing some focus groups on Long Island and the audience, the, the, the guys in the audience, because we only did men in the focus groups because that's the ESPN primary audience, were ranting and raving when Andrea Kramer came on, uh, who is one of the better football reporters, I think, in the business, saying she can't possibly know anything. She's a woman. How can she know anything? And then going on and on about this. I, I wanted to, and the research guy wouldn't let me do it. Behind the, the window with those of us watching were the producer of the program and the director of the program, both of whom were women. <laughs> and I wanted to take them out and introduce them and was told I couldn't. Yeah. But there are, there are a ton of, of women at ESPN who know sports, who do it really well, and I think frequently don't get the kind of credit that, that they ought to because of that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a very important point. I'm, I'm still actually processing myself. Um, as far as experiences, obviously I haven't been in the business quite as long as everyone else here. But I've had some of what Kevin was just talking about. I, I had a story that I broke. Uh, this was a few weeks ago when a coach that I was covering basically got fired. Uh, and everyone was kind of like, oh, well, how did you get a hold of that? <laughs> you know, that was the vibe when the press conference happened later that day. But, you know, it is because I just happen to have a good relationship with a coach. It had nothing to do with what the coach looked like and what I looked like. Uh, but I know that that was definitely a thought going on there. Um, something really funny, and I'll say this really quickly, Sean, speaking of your uh, situation with your name, I've had that happen with me a lot. You know, I've had a lot of readers who say, you know, Coley Harvey, you know, they'll, they'll actually see me in person and say, you're Coley Harvey, you know, you're, <laughs> I, I thought you were some old white guy with a beer belly, you know. <laughs> I mean, but that's, you know, that's what happens. As long as, you know, they don't necessarily have to know I'm black, but as long as they respect my reporting, my reporting style, my writing style, and then they say, oh, wow, you're black, I don't care, that's fine with me. We'll switch the focus a little bit to the diversity among the athletes, uh, can focus on the NFL at first. Um, the NFL has a pretty good balance, you know, comparatively in terms of racial diversity, uh, but when you break it down position by position, I don't think that diversity is, is always there. Um, you know, other than Peyton Hillis in Cleveland, I don't think there's a marquee white, white running back uh, I'm not sure if there are any black kickers, black punters. Um, why do you guys think that disparity occurs? Um, and I guess the same could be said for, uh, you know, white point guards in the NBA or something along those lines. Well, I, I don't know if there are any sociology students out here, but, you know, there's a uh, um, uh, there's the idea of stacking that gets discussed in sociology when it comes to sports and how um, people based on uh, coaches or general managers expectations of their athletic talent get funneled into one position or another and for a long time um, uh, you know because football was thought to be this complicated intellectual sport um, and because of racist beliefs that black men uh, were not uh, intellectually um, uh, equal to white men uh, they were not given the critical jobs in sports of quarterback, center, middle linebacker. Um, uh, we've gotten away from that, I think. Uh, but the flip side is is that uh, if you're a young um, white running back uh, coming up, you're much less likely to be able to hold on to that job, not because of your talent, but because of your skin color, because coaches uh, will assume that you don't have the uh, intellectual uh, and athletic ability to be able to play running back. And so you may get shifted to another position. And I know this argument came up two years ago with Toby Gerhardt when he was uh, running roughshod over the Pac-10 to so whether or not he was a legitimate um, Heisman, candidate, uh, Heisman Trophy candidate. And there were people who wrote columns suggesting that the only reason that he wasn't was because he was white. And that was so um, uh, um, out of the norm for what people thought. And I think a lot of that still goes on today. Yeah, yeah, you could even look at basketball. You talk about Jimmer Fredette this past year, even our own John Sherna here. People, you know, I mean, the guy can shoot. He can flat out play, but doesn't get the credit for it because he's a, a white guard, you know. Um, but, uh, but, but to the issue of the numbers, you know, actually speaking of sociology, I think that one thing is the self-fulfilling prophecy. I actually did a little bit of sociology when I was here at Northwestern, but the self-fulfilling prophecy that, you know, if you keep portraying that image of the, the white kicker, the black running back, it comes true. You know, kids 
see that in high school say okay I don't want to kick you know no one else who looks like me is doing that it's not the the glamorous spot the glamorous spot is to be the running back or the other kid who says well I'm not really athletic enough to to be a running back or to be a receiver I'll be the kicker you know so I think that that's part of the uh, the scenario as well as well as uh, everything that, that Kevin just, Kevin just said as well for that we can switch to switch to him for a second what do you guys think about the idea of comparing uh, athletes to other athletes that are different races. Uh, this past March, the New York Times ran an article about Jimmer Fredette and compared him to Kyle Korver, Jeff Hornacek, Jason Capono, uh, basically white guards. It seems like you could compare him to maybe an Eddie House, a Nate Robinson. Uh, is that a fair comparison? Does it happen in other sports? What do you guys think? I, I racked my brain last <laughs> night trying to find a black athlete that Jimmer Fredette played like, and I couldn't. They just couldn't do it. I mean, I went back 20 years looking up different guys. Maybe he's kind of like, you know, based on his size and what his style of play is, and I couldn't do it. I mean, it really is. He's he's very similar to a lot of those white players. So what I did instead was looked at Kevin Love. And Kevin Love is, is a white player, amazing, right? And you look at his numbers, and the irony is, is he's actually not that much different than Kevin Garnett. You know, I mean, when you look at his numbers, the the – intensity with which he plays defense and just going after every loose ball and the fact that he's actually got some offensive weapons and a decent jump shot he really is very similar in size uh, mentality and and production is is Kevin Garnett and and then I thought back well who else does KG remind me of and he kind of reminds me of Kevin Willis you know you remember Kevin Willis back in the day when he was with the Atlanta Hawks and and again he was a 2010 guy very consistently and so, uh, you know, I thought that was an example, but I couldn't come up with anything for Jimmer Fredette. I mean, sadly, the only guys I could compare him to were other white guards who were about his size and who did what he did, which is to shoot well from outside, do okay penetrating, and play very limited defense. And the way Kyle Corbett's been playing, I think he would take issue with being compared to <laughs> Kyle Corbett this, this juncture. Um, I, I think that just happens. I think it's it's natural. You know, people try and rack their brains. It did the same with with Cam Newton, you know, you get these images in your head and you, you, you know, if it's a black quarterback, you've got to compare that black quarterback to another black quarterback. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, I it's fortunate if it's a really good black quarterback, it's unfortunate if it's not. Um, but, you know, the other thing about this is, is that people of color, whether it's athletics, politics, acting, we get judged collectively. You know, that was a problem with the whole black coaching thing. You know, if a black coach does well, then the reaction is, oh, see, black coaches can coach. Or if one does well, then everybody wonders, oh, what does that mean for other black coach, uh, other aspiring uh, black men who want to be coaches? That doesn't happen with white coaches. That doesn't happen with white quarterbacks. You know, he, Shuler, was horrible. But <laughs> white quarterbacks continue to get chances as well they should. Um, uh, you know, I always thought it was interesting one time when uh, John Thompson was asked about um, being the first black coach to win the uh, NCAA tournament, um, how proud he was of that. And he, and he basically said, you know, I'm not proud of it uh, at all because there were black men who could have won this championship beforehand. They just were not given the opportunity. So that collective judgment is, is, is a real issue. And for all you students out there who are thinking of doing what, what some of us are doing, just don't do the comparison. It's so lazy. I mean, it's and it's fruitless. I mean, it'd have to be the perfect storm for you to be able to come up with somebody who is so similar to somebody else. It just never happens, and there's so many instances of it not working out. You know, I remember when the Vikings took some kid named Chris Hovan, who was at Boston College, and they compared him to John Randall, which was a joke because other than the fact that he was a hard worker, there was no other similarity, and he, and he flamed out very quickly. Meanwhile, John Randall's a Hall of Fame defensive tackle. Completely unjustified comparison. So I, I think it's just a, a lazy thing to do and, you know, let these guys, instead of projecting them to be like somebody else, just, you know, see what happens, you know, and maybe just actually do some reporting instead of just speculating on what somebody's going to be like. I, I think at the end of the day, I mean, Really, it's about the writer or the reporter who, who puts it out there. And again, as we saw with the numbers, they're predominantly white men. So they don't necessarily, I mean, they're reporters, so they do their homework. But I think you, you 
when you compare things and analyze things, you go to what's natural and what you're comfortable with. And, and I think that they're not comfortable with comparing one race to another. It's a very comfortable thing to compare white men to white men, black men to black men, white women to white women, et cetera. It's uncomfortable to go the opposite way either way because we're also not comparing black athletes to white athletes. It goes it both ways. And I think it's just an uncomfortable situation. So um, you're getting people who are purposely staying with in races or I think your advice is the best. Don't compare at all. I would agree with that, but for, for a slightly different reason. I think so much of what makes you successful in, in the NFL or in the NBA is what's up here as much as your physical ability. And I don't know how you compare that. Um, I think you can have two athletes who have the same kind of skills and the same kind of numbers, and one will succeed because they are smarter or mentally tougher than the other one. And, and you can't get at that, So, which is why I would absolutely agree with you. Don't get into that in the first place. Are you guys think the public's concern about race in sports, diversity in sports, has evolved in the last two decades, three decades? Public's concern about it, if any. I, I was going to say I don't. I don't know if they care. I, I think I think they care whether their team wins or loses. Um, but beyond that, I, I I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I think they care when they're forced to confront it. Um, I mean, when I started writing a uh, sports column in 1990 or 91, whatever it was, there were three or four other black columnists in major newspapers in the country. And all of us, you know, went through the same battles and heard the same um, arguments. Um, I always joke that my sports editor, um, Dave Smith, for the first few years, every six months he would call me in his office. It was the same thing. Kevin, have a seat. Kevin, why are you writing about race so much? Why do you have to write about this? Why you I would say, Dave, I'm not writing about race this much. I've written this column and this column, but those are columns that have never been written in the history of the Dallas Morning News, and those are what resonate with people, all the with, with resonate with people the most. So there is a perception that that's true. And you say okay, then you call me back six months later and have the same conversation, and then finally I heard him on radio one day after I'd been doing this a couple of years, and a caller called in asking the same question, and he said, "That's just your perception." Kevin's written this column, and he's written that column. <laughs> it just resonates with you because we never had anybody write about these issues in the paper. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think people get, um, uh, I think they are, they still see the sports section or they still, still see sports news as being fun or an escape from, from things that are in the Metro page or on the front page. Um, but at the end of the day, the things that happen in sports are uh, really a reflection of what happens in society. They're the same things, it's just uh, a, a different arena. And I also might add, not only a different arena, but a brighter arena than they've ever seen these things discussed before, which is why stories, you know, narratives like Jack Johnson at the turn of the last century is the first black heavyweight champion of the world. Um, obviously, Jackie Robinson, um, Carlos and Smith, Muhammad Ali, that's why these stories, those narratives stand out more, transcend sports more than we have seen narratives in politics or theater um, or any other walk of life because it's sports and everybody pays attention. You were talking a little bit about the, uh, the coaching issue. When a black coach is successful, then it says something about all black coaches. Switching to the NFL a little bit, what do you guys think about the Rooney rule? Uh, where teams are required to interview at least one candidate uh, of color before they hire a head coach? Well, first of all, it's absolutely a positive and, um, you know, was very necessary. And uh, I went back and kind of just jogged through my memory and, and looked it up, but all the NFL had African-American head coaches, the programs they took over were always in shambles. You know, they never got the desirable jobs. You know, Archell took over for the, you know, for the Raiders after Mike Shanahan had had a terrible, like, a, I think, seven and nine and started one and three. Archell got the job, actually finished pretty well and kept the job for, for quite some time. You know, Denny Green took over, uh, I think it was like a six and ten football team for the Vikings. Um, Tony Dungy took over, you know, 
the, the laughing stock of the NFL and help turn it into an eventual world champion. These are the kind of opportunities that African American you know coaches were relegated to. And the the great irony is everybody talks about oh there's progress you know in in, in the hiring of things. You know what's sad, guys? 2007, in my opinion, was the only significant sign of progress. And this is why. 2007, the Pittsburgh Steelers hired Mike Tomlin to be their head coach. Two years before, they had won the Super Bowl. They'd gone 8-8 eight and eight the year that Tomlin took over and Cower, you know, left. And part of it was because of injuries. That team was loaded. Everybody knew that that was a very talented football team. And it's a shame to me that the Rooney family – which pushed to put the Rooney rule and to get their peers to sort of at least take a look at an African-American coach before they made a decision. It took the Rooney family to actually practice what they preach instead of some other owner. So in, in my opinion, that's kind of shameful that they ended up having to do it. But what's the benefit? Mike Tomlin was, you know, he was not a proven coach. They were taking a risk and, and they got the reward. You know, he led them to a Super Bowl title and he just led them to another Super Bowl. And that, to me, is the significant thing about hiring of African-American head coaches. And it happened four years ago. That's sad. You know, it really is sad to me that that just happened. And since then, you've had Jim Caldwell taking over a very successful Indianapolis team. And then you have Raheem Morris taking over, you know, a pretty good team in Tampa and, and getting that opportunity. So I still think we've got a long way to go. But it's, it's unfortunate that it's, it's such a recent phenomenon that, that we're starting to see real signs of progress because it's not just about getting a job. Right now the big issue is college football. There are African American football coaches getting jobs, but they're jobs that are stacked against them. You know, you're, you're asking these guys to turn around programs that have never had any success. You know, but meanwhile Alabama opens up and they go to a guy, you know, that, that's, you know, been recycled and done it at other, other places. The jobs at like Michigan. You know, those are those are great jobs. Who do they end up going to? You know, so I, I think we're, that's kind of the next frontier that I think we have to sort of conquer is, is college football. I, th I mean, I think the Rooney Rule is great. I think at the end of the day, a lot of the African American coaches that go in under the Rooney Rule are not seriously interviewed. I think a lot of it is a token gesture, but they are given opportunities. They're given opportunities to get in front of decision makers. And a lot of those folks are getting jobs two or three years later from the initial interview they had under the Rooney Rule. And, and I think, honestly, it's about opportunity. And it's about not, you know, not the token interview, um, but, but the decision makers, you gotta look at who's making the decisions. They're the GMs and they're the owners and they are all white men. And so I think that once that starts to change, or once they start to get c more comfortable looking at African American coaches as individuals and not as a group and not as you know lumped together, I, I don't think it's going to change. And I think you know college basketball is actually doing a really good job, mm -hmm. I think, with black coaches. Um, where obviously, as you said, with college football is is pathetic. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, but but I think that the NFL and the NCA are also doing things to help help make changes. I'm actually speaking in a seminar in four weeks that the, NF that the NCAA and the NFL are putting on together for coaches, for offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators at the top level colleges and in the NFL to try to prepare folks for opportunity, for basically to be prepared when they do get these opportunities. A lot of these coaches, when they do get the opportunities to sit in front of a GM or an owner, don't interview well, their resumes are not written well, they don't know what to say because they've just been on the field and focusing on the field and and they haven't really looked at their career and put everything together that is necessary to actually get that head coaching job. So I think it's really about opportunity number one and then once you have that opportunity it's about being prepared to actually get the opportunity. Y you know you guys are probably hearing us basically pile on white males and <laughs> I, I don't want you guys to, to, to think about it the wrong way but you have to take into consideration this is the world that we all operate in and it's not just in the newsroom as we we hinted at earlier but it's also in the in the boardroom in, on the playing field the guys who are making the decisions ahead of the players ahead of the coaches are the very same people who we're interacting with as our bosses on, on a regular basis as well 
Um, to you guys' point about the Rooney, rule, the Rooney rule and whether it's a positive, absolutely, it's 100% a positive. What, it needs to, to, what needs to be taking place is that we need to lump it into with other sports, particularly with baseball. Major League Baseball is pathetic up and down, sideways and backwards for not only managerial positions, but also playing positions. And, you know, I know you guys should have the, uh, the stats there, I believe, in the graph. Major League Baseball actually, percentage-wise, if you want to talk about diversity, is actually very diverse compared to other sports. But what you're taking into consideration is that you have all of these different ethnicities represented in baseball. Meanwhile, African Americans who even had their own league at one point in time because they couldn't play in major leagues are, have been so ostracized from the game. It's it's pathetic. You know, we're talking less than 20% of major league ball players, maybe even less than I think it's 13% now uh, of major league ball players are African American. Whereas right after you know the 1950s, when Negro League ball players were starting to get into the game, you just saw this great influx of of black uh, of black talent there. Um, but to get to the point, yeah, you definitely need the Rooney Rule. I, th I think that it would be a positive uh, for coaching in baseball, for coaching in college football. Obviously, I deal with a lot of these coaches in college football right now. I have yet to really come across – actually, I take that back. I've come across Randy Shannon, who was at Miami uh, the last few years, and that's really been the only top-level Division I college football, play college football coach who's black who, who I've dealt with on a – fairly regular basis and that's that's just atrocious yeah um yeah I, I agree with all that um i happen to know uh cyrus mary who uh worked with johnny cochran as the architect of the rooney rule in fact i was just on a panel with him at Penn uh just a few weeks ago um the rooney rule is great uh the rooney, rooney rule has worked so well it needs to be applied elsewhere uh richard labchek came out the other week and said it needs to be applied to Sports journalism departments. Um, uh, I, I agree with uh, I agree with all that. I don't know where um, aspiring black coaches in NFL would be right now or GMs with without the Rooney Rule. I mean, it, before there were none, after there are plenty. Between Fritz Pollard in 1923 or 24 uh, and Art Shell in 1989, there were no black coaches in the NFL. I mean, that's that's remarkable. Um, and the reason the Rooney Rule was able to get hammered in was because the research that Cyrus Mary did showed that the few black coaches who had, uh, who had become head coaches in the NFL through at some point in the 1990s actually had higher winning percentages than their white counterparts. And so that is, if I'm not mistaken, indeed, that's a test in, in the court system for um, discrimination. And the thing about the Rooney Rule is, is that I think what gets forgotten is that uh, employment discrimination is against the law in the United States of America. And so that's why they need to do the right thing. Colleges, oddly enough, over the last couple of years, very quietly are have done much, much better. I think the numbers have moved from it stunned me from 7 to 21. Um, I think that's through all d uh, divisions. Um, but I would like to see the Rooney Rule applied to colleges, uh, not so much even, even for coaches, but as, as for, uh, you talk about management, for athletic directors. And I think it would be much easier to apply to uh, the college situation because so many colleges uh, exist on federal funds. And if you are not upholding the laws of this country, uh, you should not be able to get your federal funds. And I think we would see an overnight change um, in hiring practices in college athletics if uh, the Rooney, Rooney Rule was applied to, applied to it. What do you guys think about incorporating the Rooney Rule into newsrooms and sports staffs? I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome that. I mean, it's, it's uh, remarkable to me, you know, as I just look, you know, through my career, it just um, – you know, just j just watching, you know, the hiring of different positions and things, and it's uh, when when um, Mr. Lapchuk, he you know, he sent me the the numbers, and it was actually much worse than I thought. You know, and I I just don't quite understand how you know I've been in this business. I graduated from here in '98, and basically how little progress we've actually made. You know, and I know it's not, you know, for lack of 
you know, talent out there because I've met a lot of very talented, you know, uh, journalists of color, you know, both male and female. And it's, it's frankly very discouraging, you know. So um, I see uh, when, when jobs are filled, you know, it just seems to be sort of very similar to what was happening in the NFL with the same people kind of just getting recycled over and over. And uh, um, so, I, you know, I would welcome that, you know, for somebody like myself or, you know, my man over here to get an opportunity to sit in front of the, the right people and at least, uh, you know, have a chance to make an impression. So, you know, there was a um, there's a newspaper in the Washington, D.C. area. I won't name the newspaper, but <laughs> it it was uh, it's restarting from scratch. Its sports section is restarting from scratch, basically. And a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, uh, as they were starting to hire these positions for the Redskins beat reporter, the the uh, Nationals beat reporter and all these, all these sports positions, some of the jobs were posted on a uh, sports journalism website. Well, the thread quickly went from, okay, we've got these jobs available to here's why we shouldn't be singling out minority candidates only. You know, uh, the, the uh, president of the NABJ Sports Task Force, NABJ stands for National Association of Black Journalists, uh, Greg Lee, he chimed in on this thread basically saying, hey, we're all for getting minorities jobs. You know, I, I reached out to this sports editor who's, recom who's compiling this staff, and I said, hey, can you just give some people some looks? Just talk to some people. The guy got killed on the message board by other journalists who basically said, why? What's the point? You know, I mean, we're all on the equal playing field right now, but if you look at the numbers, I don't know if they're in there or not, we're talking 89% of all journalists are white men, 89%. There's a lot of ethnicities, you know, up here in this panel and right out here with you guys in the crowd. Why is it that 89%, you know, is the lion's share of the deal? Why, why can't it be a little bit more of a balance? And that's, that's what we've got to get to is that, you know, we talk about the Rooney Rule, yeah, that'd be great for, for sports journalism. We've also got to get a, a change of mindset among the people who we're working with because that just flat out disappointed me. I really actually wanted to print it out, and I was going to read some of the comments, but I'm not. You know, I encourage you, you can Google it. It's on the Internet. It's out there. There were some pretty foul comments about why it made no sense to look at minority candidates, and to me that, that makes no sense. Um, because I asked Pro Professor Lapchick this, but one of the areas that I feel like there is significant progress is actually hiring of on-air talent. You know, ESPN's done a terrific job with that, and... And, you know, even like local television networks are very diverse. And he didn't have the numbers for that. But I, I was curious to see from your perspective on, you know, why you feel like that area is so much further ahead. Because I would guess, you know, that it's probably close to 50-50, you know, in terms of, or 40 percent. Not 50-50. Okay. But, it, but it's yeah. significantly <laughs> higher. It's significantly <laughs> higher than what's represented in newsrooms and, and on websites. Well, and I, think, and I think that's part of the problem. Um, a lot of people coming out of school, and and that's their aim. And um, the the if more of them wanted to 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 be behind the camera, we would ultimately be better off. I, I can't tell you in in the twenty years or so I spent at ESPN, uh, we have a, a production assistant program there, uh, where we hire a lot of production assistants each year and we keep some and some yeah. but you would you would have a PA who desperately wanted to be on the air uh, which which isn't going to happen there they're going to have to go out and get some experience but you would have this discussion with them and say look I've seen what you've because we'd let them do an audition I've seen what you've done you know I'm going to be honest your chances of being on the air and be very good are not terribly good but you're smart you understand the business um, why don't you take a shot at producing, at getting a job inside, at staying in the business and making a difference? And invariably, they're going to leave and go and go try it somewhere. So it goes back to what I said in the beginning. Until we get people, uh, uh, non-white males, who are seriously interested in getting into management and changing the system, it's not going to change. I go back to it then, you know. Not that I'm a saint and not that I get – Black, every black person a job, but I honestly think it depends on the person. And we have to pull back, go into our community and pull each other up. Because quite frankly, and you know, no offense, 
but I don't I don't see white men doing it for what I, I don't think that they necessarily think there's a problem or see it necessarily I, 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 there's absolutely a problem but I think it's it is it is harder to, to sometimes deal with right it, I mean I get of course I love to black, to hire black people I don't know any qualified black people and I say okay I could tell you 10 off the top of my head off the top of my head and if you actually let me go in and, and look and think about it I could give you 30 40 like right now right today extremely qualified probably more qualified than the person you just hired so I think the NABJs are extremely important where you can go and network and and actually you know that's our most recent hire I met him there he, he got his master's at Medill but I met him at NABJ and literally you know People just sort of said, oh, my God, who was he? He's amazing. He writes this. He writes this. You know, you got to meet him. She also went to Medill. And, you know, within a year, he was on our staff. And and he just he just stood out. He was just bright, and he was amazing. And, um, you know, it took a year to find the right job that was open and, and a right fit. But I think that had it not been for NABJ, we would have never met him or known him. And I, I honestly just think that it's the decision makers, like you were saying, who are, who are pulling others up with them. And I think it's the same thing for gender. It's the same thing for women. I think that it's the women who are in decision making positions who need to pull other women up with them. And, and I think that unfortunately, f for some, sometimes, we don't want to help each other. There are definitely times we don't want to help each other. I don't know if we're threatened by one another. Um, but I think that also all c can be an issue, and because there's so few of us, again, you know, it's almost like the athlete in the story. You bring someone in, they say, ah, you know, like this on-air talent I hired. Oh, so you're a black woman, so you hired a black woman. Oh, so you went to Medill. She went to Medill. Hmm, you know, and, and I'm saying this person is the most qualified person out there, hands down. Um, but we get looked at funny, looked at twice, and, and I think there's some people who aren't willing to put themselves out there like that. It starts, starts here, but also starts before here. It starts in high school. It starts with trying to get kids interested in wanting to be a part of this field. Granted, everyone looks at ESPN. Everyone looks at Sports Center. Everyone looks at the athletes. They want to play the sports or they want to be on ESPN, but they don't want to do the grunt work that, <laughs> that, that can kind of get you there. You know, And I, I think that we have to figure out some kind of way to, uh, to get kids really interested in understanding what it is that Sean does, what it is that I do, what it is that Kevin does, what it is that Dee Dee does, what it is that, that Bob does. Uh, you know, and, and maybe maybe w we would start to maybe see a little bit of a change there. And then it also comes down to here. Um, I mean, quick story, my freshman year, which was in 2003, September 2003, we were all just before this talking about FIST 217, which those of you who are Medill students, you know about FIST 217, that's where convocation and all that is when you start school. My freshman year, I looked around that building, just happened to kind of look around, just uh, let's see what, you know, see who I see. I was the only black male in the entire auditorium. When I graduated, there was actually one other young man in the undergraduating class with me. He, he had transferred into Medill while we were at school. So it was just two of us who graduated from Medill. Uh, there were a number of females who obviously weren't doing sports, they were all you know, interested in news, magazine, and that's all well and good, but I was by myself. That's what I mean, it also comes down to here. We've gotta, you know, Medill, I don't wanna get into too many things, but we've gotta get kids interested, not only in the, in the process, not only interested in the career field, but get them here, get them to, to, to get into the place. I mean, we talk about affordability and that can be an issue for some people sometimes. But um, anyway, that, that's a whole nother tangent for another time. <laughs>